Hello, welcome to learning about clinical trials and where does it all begin? I'm Vivian C. Fontes and I'll be sharing some important information with you today. Thank you for being here. So I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to know what clinical trials are, how they work, what an informed consent is, and the importance of participation in clinical trials. Some people will ask, what are clinical trials? And they're definitely a very safe way of being treated. A clinical trial is simply uh, another type of treatment that comes from a lab. Uh, scientists use these great ideas. They put them into a theory and eventually into practice with mm, some lab in, in the lab. And eventually, comes into the clinical side of the entire process where humans will actually participate in this type of treatments. Uh, they're usually very safe. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, rules and regulations to follow in order to use these new treatments in humans. And um, in our center, we definitely do uh, research and the trials are obviously focus on finding uh, either a cure for uh, cancer or a improvement of mm, life quality, or um, sometimes we are trying to prevent cancer from happening at all. So at this moment, um, sometimes people will ask, tell me about the side effects of mm, um, clinical trials and um, in many ways, when we do a clinical trial, we're also addressing the diminishment of side effects because the standard of care, which is what we already have um, approved by the FDA and what is uh, used on a regular basis for many people, not just in our country, but around the world, uh, present severe side effects um, in some of the trials that we are working on are basing their um, research in finding new treatments with less side effects. And as I mentioned before, some of these clinical trials focus on the improvement of the quality of life or extending life. Even though some people will live with cancer for the rest of their lives, some of these trials uh, focus on, or the objective is to extend life with uh, good quality. So uh, research studies involve humans, and this is what, what makes a difference between the research in lab and research in the clinical side. It involves humans, and the focus or the objective is to, um, uh, to make sure that the new treatments that we're trying um, are better than the standard of care. And in somehow along the line, Within these uh, trials, we are, try we are uh, comparing what we already have in the standard side with the new um, trial uh, drug to ensure that the new one is of best quality and best uh, effectiveness than what we already have. So that's one of the main objectives. And obviously the participation um, of humans um, makes the trial um, I would say more um, uh, valid because uh, it gives us better evidence. So there are four types of trials. One is the prevention, the screening, the treatment, and the quality of life. And obviously, prevention is to, we're looking to reduce the risk and to prevent cancer from happening. The screening is to make sure that we have something in our hands that will actually find the disease. And the earlier we find a disease, the easier it is to cure it or to control it. Obviously, we, uh, with a trial or with a trial that is actually um, treating, is to treat the disease either to control it or to eradicate it. And obviously, the quality of life is weak because we always want to make sure that the patient has a good quality of life. So we have to make sure that even though we may have um, a situation where we deal with cancer, 
we want to make sure that we have the possibility of live with quality. So how do they work? Well, they are designed to compare the standard of care, like I mentioned before, and those are the drugs that have been already approved by the FDA with the treatments that we are trying. That's how they work. We compare. And in order to compare, we need to use them with humans uh, to see how people respond to these new drugs. And this process is very, very regulated and very monitored. So because we always um, have to ensure that the safety of the patient is priority. There are four phases in a clinical trial. And the phase number one is the first time it's actually um, used in humans. And what we're trying to do at this point is to find the effective dosage and the exact dosage um, to maintain the level of toxicity safe for the human. And usually we will actually recruit at least 50 participants, usually no more than 80. And when that's done, it goes into phase two. And phase two is to further um, ensure that the definition of um, safety of the toxicity is there. And the, um, the priority is always in every phase, the safety of the patient. At this point, we will recruit from 80 to 300 patients. And sometimes at this point, the drug is actually approved to be um, um, thrown into the general market because the findings are so magnificent that at this point, the FDA decides that it's actually a safe and efficient drug to provide to the general market. Phase three, is basically the last uh, phase of the trial, indeed. Um, and at this moment, we are trying to ensure that this drug is better than the standard of care one, that the one that already exists, approved by the FDA. And we are comparing, at this moment, the new drug, the one that's on trial, to the one that's already approved. And we will enroll, enroll more than a um, 1,000 patients for this particular phase. Now, sometimes, as I said before, uh, when drugs are approved during phase number two, they skip number three, okay, phase number three. And when phase number three is over, that we ensure the safety of the patient, we uh, ensure that we have the toxicity level that is safe for the patient, that we have the right dosage, that we know that it's better the results, the outcome of this drug is better than the ones that we already have approved. Then it goes into the general market. And even under, after it's been approved, it goes under phase number four. And phase number four is a continuance of surveillance because we want to make sure that at that time when this drug is being used by millions sometimes of people, we want to make sure the new findings of new possible potential uh, findings are not um, harmful to the health of the patients. So therefore we have to monitor this drug even on phase four after it's been approved because we wanna make sure that at all times the safety of the patient is our priority. In order to participate in a trial, uh, we definitely have to inform the patient of what the patient is getting himself into. And uh, in order to do that, we have what we call the informed consent. And the informed consent is a process with a document. And I said it's a document, it's a process because this document requires an educational session. And a coordinator of the trial will sit down with the patient and explain all the details about this clinical trial. This, clini this consent or this document We'll talk about the benefits, the risks, any charges, any responsibilities on the patient's behalf, our responsibility as, as researchers, and definitely the expectations. Um, at this moment, the patient has also the opportunity to ask all the questions that come to mind. And nothing can happen, nothing at all in regards to the clinical trial uh, participation 
before that patient signs the consent, okay? One of the things that I need to um, inform you of is that the patient usually doesn't sign this consent right away when the patient is told that he or she may be uh, eligible for a trial, the, the patient will take this consent home or wherever he wants to and discuss it with family members, with doctors or healthcare providers of his choice aside from our institution. And then after he makes the decision, he can come back, have the informed consent session with the coordinator again and sign it. Then that's when the participant will start with the pre-screening process to ensure that the patient is eligible for participation. Now, this is very important to understand. Being in a clinical trial is voluntary. There's no coercion, there's no obligation, no one can force you into participating in a clinical trial. However, once you sign the consent, there is a commitment, and obviously we expect you to keep that commitment until the end of the trial. Nevertheless, you are not obligated to participate entirely in the clinical trial if you decide to withdraw in the midst of it or at the beginning or towards the end. It's your choice, it's voluntary. So you have the right to quit at any time you want. Keep in mind that if you choose to withdraw from a clinical trial prior its ending, it's necessary you let the coordinator know just to make sure there's no need of winning you out of the drug. But sometimes just dropping and withdrawing and not taking the drug overnight may cause some uh, side effects that you want to avoid. Who can participate? Many people will ask. Well, I'd like to say that anybody can participate. Nevertheless, you have to go through the pre-screening process and confirm that you are eligible to participate. This eligibility process is determined by inclusion and exclusion criteria. And um, it's like a checklist. If the study has 10 items in the inclusion criteria and you check all of them, you say, wow, I can participate. However, if the exclusion criteria list has 10 items and you have one checked out, then you're not able to participate. So both lists have to um, kind of align in order to participate in a clinical trial. Okay? And obviously this process helps investigators achieve best uh, significant results. Does it cost to participate? This is a very general concern and very valuable one. Um, as I, as participant of a clinical trial, at one point in my life, I wanted to make sure if it was going to cost me any money. Well, we tend to forget as patients that we have full uh, payments and we have mm, deductibles, and we will always be responsible for those regardless regardless of the fact that we participate in a clinical trial. In addition to that, there may be some extra costs that at the time of, uh, of the informed consent, you may be informed. The other thing that I recommend is for uh, someone that is actually um, constant, um, contemplating participation in a trial to speak to their insurance company. They can let you know if there will be some coverage on um, your on the participant's uh, pocket, or if the insurance will cover everything related to the study. Now, usually anything that goes under the list of a standard of care, any care, like for example, some lab work, some imagery work will be uh, considered standard of care that is covered by the insurance company without any doubt. Nevertheless, nevertheless anything that is extra, any extra lab work, any extra imagery work, any, um, any drug that is on trial, experimental drug, that will be covered by the sponsor. However, I will always check with the insurance company and with the coordinators to see if they have any information in the protocol that will let you know if you have any extra cost out of your pocket besides the co-payments and deductibles. Well, some people will say, well, how long do I have to participate in a trial? 
each trial is different. Each trial has its own protocol, its own uh, rules and regulations. So it's difficult to tell you you'll be in a trial for three months. So I was in a trial for a year and a half. Some trials will last more than five years. It all depends on the trial. So it's good to go through that uh, informed consent because that's when you will be answered this question um, specifically related to the trial that you'll be participating in. Now, remember, even though the trial may last 15, uh, 15 months or five years, you can withdraw at any time, it's voluntary. And here's some references of the information that I have given you, if you like to look into uh, clinical trials a little bit deeper. Thank you so much for being here. I hope that you have learned something new today. If you have further questions about clinical trials, feel free to call my extension, what you see on the screen, 813-745-3952. Or if you like some more information on our programs through the library, uh, feel free to write that at that particular email address that you see on the screen or call them at 813-745-1690. And thank you again.